Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is accelerating quantitative systems and pharmacology with uh, machine learning. So essentially, how do you get peer speed out of your program? Um, now, one question that always needs to be addressed with this is, you know, why do we need just pure unadulterated speed? Um, well, the reason is because whenever anyone talks about virtual populations or sensitivity analysis or doing optimization of parameters, you're really talking about hundreds of thousands of simulations, right? You're, you're talking about doing it over a huge parameter space and you're doing this, you know, in QSP, you're doing this on hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, or in some cases, even millions of ODEs, right? So we need to be able to take these models that can take days long to simulate and we need to scrunch them down so that way we can just, you know, pop them out one, one after the other and, and just kind of, you know, make it like it was nothing. Um, and the real reason why we need this speed is because the one piece that can be cut short in, in the whole clinical process is the computer simulation, right? You, you can't necessarily, you know, take the clinical trial and say, you know, we want to get this drug out quicker. So let's make the clinical trial be two months instead, right? That doesn't necessarily happen. I mean, COVID, but, uh, but basically, you know, if, if, if there's any team that has a time crunch, what we've learned from the clients that we've worked with is it's the computer simulation team. So can we get them something so that way their models are automatically found and that they're solved much quicker? Um, our organization has accelerated many applications. So when I say Julius IML, this is the open source organization. So one very nice uh, example of this is uh, the NASA launch services. You can watch their video where they talk about how we recently gave them a 15,000 X acceleration over their original Simulink model. So it was something that where they used to be able to build the reports that they'd show, you know, at the end of the day, where now it's an interactive report um, because of the, you know, 15,000 X uh, speed gain. Um, another case that showed up recently, which I'll walk a little bit more into, but not too much, um, will be uh, at, at the last ACOP, we talked about a 175x acceleration that we got for the Pfizer Quantitative Systems Pharmacology Group by being able to automatically transform their differential equation solves to, to specialized GPU-based solvers. And there's more on that in, in, the, uh, in the Julia Computing case study. Um, a recent example of this form is uh, is where you know someone was was um, a roboticist was uh, taking a look and trying to use SimPy for some calculation. Uh, Twenty minutes later, they decided, well, let me try the new Julia Symbolics uh, library. And um, in, before the before SimPy was ever able to able to finish, they had coded up in this other library. It ran in one point five milliseconds. And they were, they were done, right? So th this really highlights how much of like a productivity gain, you know, the, the speed ups can be once you start being able to accelerate these domains. Um, now, the, the foundation of accelerating uh, quantitative systems pharmacology comes down to accelerating differential equation solves. And, and the way that this is done is essentially through optimizing the user's function F and then optimizing the differential equation solve to require the least calls to F and be able to take the largest time steps. And that can be a whole talk in itself, but there's a lot of cases to be able to show that, you know, not only is are the differential equation solvers of the SIML organization um, able to to, you know, outperform things like uh, those from Python or MATLAB, um, but also things like uh, things like the CV ODE codes or LSODA, you know, these original C codes, because it's using some advanced techniques that have been developed over the last 10 years for improving the, the you know, stability and, and, uh, and the performance when you have really large time steps. And I'm skipping over this to get to the ML parts, though. Right. So the, the, the key, though, is that the next generation of algorithms will not just be pure numerical algorithms. There, there's kind of two classes of algorithms that we've been in, incorporating. Uh, one of them is surrogates and digital twins, which is this idea of being able to use machine learning to be able to make a low resolution version of your model almost as accurate as your original one. Um, so that way it can you can use it in place of the other. And the other is for a form of, of automated model discovery. Um, for, for this talk, I'm just going to focus on pure speed here. Here, though you can watch some of my other talks on YouTube, which goes into how you can automatically discover models from data. Um, now, now, the key issue when trying to apply machine learning into this domain is that stiffness is really prevalent across quantitative systems pharmacology. Now, what does stiffness mean? It's, it's kind of this mysterious thing that most people only know as, I tried ODE 45, it failed, and so I went to ODE 15S, right? Uh, but the, the real reason behind the phenomena is because when you have stiffness, what happens is you have a, a timescale separation that makes it so that 
that way your local derivative information is crazy large, right? You kind of have this wiggle going around your, your, you know, you have this very slow scale behavior going on and you have a very fast scale behavior. And if you ask yourself, what is my change right now? Your change will be a very large number because it's going to be very quickly going from positive to negative. And this is why you need implicit solvers, right? Because it's this idea that if you just try to take your local information and try to step forward, then you'll be, then you'll not be kind of incorporating the right information because local information is not okay in a stiff system. Um, now, you know, remember this red line, right? Because this basically means that on a stiff system, you'll expect to see that anything that tries to extrapolate forwards is going to be unstable. And we're going to see that machine learning techniques, you know, all the ones that are used, like recurrent neural networks and stuff, they have this behavior, exact behavior, when they're applied to a stiff system. Um, and so the question is going to be, can we find machine learning architectures which are robust to this behavior so that way they can work well in quantitative systems pharmacology? And so here's the challenge, right? Here's one of these stiff systems. It's the Orego ODE. It's one of these chemical reaction networks everyone knows and loves. You know, so it has these, these common spikes and it has this behavior where you need to worry about some time points a lot more than others. And the question is, can we train a neural network to even just reproduce this behavior, right? Just, just three ODEs, can't be hard, right? It turns out that if you try most machine learning that you see out there, it'll fail. And why will it fail? Well, if you look at recurrent and residual neural networks, they are in some sense an Euler discretization on a neural ODE. Now, why is that bad? Well, because you know that Euler methods are unstable on stiff systems. And so we'll see in a second here that if you try to tr make this thing train on this on this kind of thing, it'll look exactly like what happens when you use an explicit ODE solver on one of these systems, which is not good, right? So if, if these architectures, you know, if the standard architectures that we're looking at don't work in this case, how do we change our machine learning to work specifically for this kind of this field? Um, one thing that you might want to think about is physics informed neural networks. Physics informed neural networks work for a lot of cases, but they have a caveat. So the, if you actually look at what gradient descent is, gradient descent is Euler's method on parameter space. And so if your parameter space is stiff, which you can show happens on these stiff systems, then your optimization process is not going to work out, right? So, so what, you, what this basically means is that uh, on these very stiff systems, the other form of stiffness that you see is actually in the optimization, that first order optimization. It is an ODE solve of a stiff system, which is hard to solve. And so that means that physics informed neural networks will end up failing. And, and you, there's actually a very nice paper that goes into exactly the gradient pathologies that come up here. So if you can't use gradient descent and you can't use recurrent neural networks on a time series, what do you even do, right? So what we did was we went back to the drawing board and we, and we looked at what was going on. And what we saw was that you can, you can create a new architecture, which we call the continuous time echo state network, which is kind of like a neural ODE, except you fix the, the, you fix the parameters of the first layer, you make them constant. And the reason why you do this is because if you only fit the last layer, you can fit it using a linear solve, which is going to be implicit over all time. And then you can use an SVD uh, factorization to be able to control the growth factor. I mean, if you know your numerical analysis, you know that that's going to be more stable than an LU, which is more stable than an explicit optimization. And so this kind of, this kind of pulls it all into the space of be essentially being a fully implicit method, but in machine learning space, you know, thinking about it as like, this is the implicit version of a recurrent neural network. Um, and how does it do? Well, if we take a look at one of these, you know, chemical reaction systems, so, you know, this is a auto, uh, auto catalysis model, which has been used since the, the 70s. Um, the reason why it was created was to break, uh, break uh, ODE solvers, right? This is the one that originally led to Gears uh, and stiff ODE method. So if, if you look at it, it doesn't look like there's too much going on because it is so stiff, you have to look at the, the log scale. And when you look at it in log scale, you see, aha, there's, there's more behavior going on in a very, very early section of the simulation. Um, and this log scale behavior is actually what will cause most things to fail. So what happens when you train these uh, all these architectures on this on the simple three dimensional time series? And what you see is, you know, the, the LSTM and also the RNN has the same behavior. It does exactly what you would expect a, a, an explicit method to do. It takes a look at the derivative at the very start and it says the derivative is 10 to the 10th because of the, of the values. And so it jumps all the way up to, you know, 10 to the 10th and it comes right back down when the derivative is very large. 
that's just expected. It's the same exact behavior that you see as an explicit OD solver on, on this kind of problem. So, you know, it, it has you know, error in the range of, you know, thousands of percent. Um, you know, physics informed neural networks, they look like they almost work, but they, they never tend to actually find the right parameters because near the right parameter range, you have a steep drop in the gradient because once again, that is the, you know, very high stiffness of parameter space. So it never really trains all the way. And the only thing that really captures the system is the continuous time echo state network. It's able to find a system that, that matches the behavior of the original system. And it's able to then train on very large, you know, you're able to use this on very large sets of ODEs and you get a essentially a version of the ordinary differential equation, which is much simpler to solve. You essentially turn stiff ODEs into non-stiff ODEs. Um, we show that this happens all over the place. So here, for example, is the example that we that we uh, work with Pfizer on. We 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 take we took that model and said, well, what works here? Well, the only thing that was even able to get below you know fifty percent error on on this model was the continuous time echo state network. And I'm here from one of the grad students that there's actually even a better version of, of the training of this now that has it purely below 5% um, with the continuous time echo state network. So, so this really goes to show that, you know, a lot of these machine learning uh, methods will fail on these really stiff problems. And that's to be expected because they're essentially the explicit version uh, of a machine learning architecture. And so they will fail when, when you see this, this version of stiffness. Um, now, when we pull this all the way to, to these large models, right? We, we took something like the Arabidopsis model uh, from the SBML bio models library. Um, this model was large enough that if you try to read it in a Kopasi, you, you just got a straight crash. Um, the SBML toolbox took 100, uh, 870 seconds to read, uh, one, one second to simulate each, each path. Um, if you just did vanilla Julia, you got that down to 60 seconds to read and 0 0.6 seconds simulate. So some people would be happy with that. But when you then are, when you built this surrogate, what you ended up with was something that does an instant read and 0 0.62 seconds to simulate, which is, you know, a full 100 times uh, speed up over the simulation speed before, but also, you know, also cuts out the read time because it's now crunched it down to an essential uh, 20 ODEs capturing the behavior that we're looking for. Um, we see that th this behavior shows up all over the place. So here, for example, is an 8,000 equation model that was a, 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 a heat cycle um, where we show that versus Dimola, one of these uh, Modelica compilers, we're able to train a continuous time echo state network and get something that's about 570 times faster than, than the leading Modelica compilers, right? So it's this, this kind of surrogate technique as part of the simulation process really leads to some really nice results. Um, now, the, the key to this continuous time echo state network, though, is that it itself is a differential equation. So, you know, you can take it and put it inside another differential equation because it is just a differential equation itself. So you can say this is, you know, this part of my differential equation is this model, and I put this other model around it. So one of the examples that we did was we said, well, there was a heating cycle, which was part of an air conditioning. So let's put different buildings around it, and let's try to optimize what the building would be. Um, and we show that we, once you once you do this, you can actually do a global optimization of the of building designs um, about 340x faster than the original simulation was. Actually, the entire optimization process is faster than the original simulation. Um, now we we haven't shown this exact you know composability aspect in in the quantitative systems pharmacology field yet, but it's it works at, with the same underpinnings, and we have the examples undergoing right now, and hopefully done by the end of the week. Um, but this is all coming together as Pumas QSP, uh, powered by Julia Sim. So this is this connection between Julia Computing and Pumas AI, where there is a full model library, which has, you know, all of these LML and SBML models. Um, and we have the ability to now, because the, the, the surrogatization process is so robust, we can basically take models directly from the library, spit them through a surrogatization pipeline. So that way it just generates, uh, you know, the fast version using some nice defaults. Um, then we can incorporate into that surrogate some data that you have to make it more accurate than the original model. This is known as a digital twin. Um, and then we can use the, these uh, digital twins within the virtual population setting, right? So, I mean, that, that's really the key, right? The moment you start saying, I want to have 100,000 ODE solves, that's the point where you want to have the very accelerated version. And that's where we have this whole pipeline uh, leading towards with, with a GUI on top, because that's, you know, every single time we talk to someone who's a domain scientist, they 
they always want a GUI. So there, there's where your pictures will come from. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much. Um, this is uh, hopefully a very quick overview of this uh, machine learning integrated um, simulation pipeline that's been growing up around the uh, Julius IML uh, ecosystem. Yeah, thank you.